Greetings and welcome to the Mount Rushmore Podcast Special Edition, Richard and Michael versus you, the audience. The topic is non-actor directors acting in other directors' movie. Richard, you chose this topic. Why? Because I love the title so much. <laughs> it's, such a, it's such a mouthful, and I wanted to see. I wanted to see if you would get through it in one piece. I barely did. I barely. No, did. I just, I just, I just love this idea of being a famous director and then going and acting in some, like usually a friend of yours or someone that you admire, in one of their movies, and suddenly you get you have to go from being the guy who's calling all the shots to just be another schlub on on set. Mm -hmm. And I just think that that's such a wonderful dynamic that I, I, I just but something got got me thinking about a lot of different potential choices and kind of made me think hey there's a lot of there's a lot of fertile ground we can uh, we can dig through here well cool all right our normal format is michael and richard going head to head against each other or a guest but this is the first round of our special summer slam edition and we're pitting your recorded suggestions round for round against Richard and Michael's challenging topics. Richard and Michael, are I can't believe you Richard, ready we're to gonna go? lose to, we're gonna lose to some nobodies. No <laughs> offense, <laughs> listeners. Are listeners literally nobody? All right, let's come out swinging. Let's start swinging here uh, with this first choice. Okay, okay, I got one for you. Uh, 1969, Terry Southern story, The Magic Christian. In the lounge of the Magic Christian, singing uh, Mad About the Boy, torch singer, Yul Brenner, and sitting at the bar nursing a drink is Roman Polanski. All right. That was Art Hadley, Lawrence, Kansas resident and fan of the show, coming out swinging there with Roman Polanski cameoing in the Magic Christian uh, I sent you guys a link in which he shows up, boom, right at the bar at one minute and 11 seconds. And it, this individual, uh, in no uncertain terms, has led a very um, storied life, Roman Polanski. That's one way to uh, put it. Yeah. <laughs> in <laughs> which he was you. Yeah, writing actually some uh, you know, very ugly chapters in that story himself, but also having some ugly chapters written for him. Um, escaping the Nazis as a young child, uh, unfortunately not escaping uh, the effects of the Manson family on his um, um, uh, wife, Sharon Tate, and then undoing his own fate uh, through some very, very bad things uh, um, um, done uh, with young, young women. <laughs> but right. let's just say sitting at a bar and having a uh, Yul Brenner in drag sing to you is the least weird thing that's ever happened <laughs> for Roman Polanski. So what the deal is, is now in the ring is Roman Polanski cameoing in The Magic Christian in this scene. And Richard and Michael, you've got to go up against and kind of try to uh, beat this choice. Uh, what do you got, Michael? Okay, well, my first choice is Steven Spielberg as Steven Spielberg directing Tom Cruise as Austin Powers in Austin Pusty, an in-movie film in the film <laughs> Austin Powers in Goldmember from 2002. Oh, and my I God. Think I, just I wanted, knew you were going to do this one, Michael. I, I could have I, set my watch to it. <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, it's very uh, – I think a, a, most of mine are kind of um, cameos rather than like a director flexing their acting chops. But yeah. – this is one that um, you kind of are introduced into this, a very Mission Impossible, James Bond style opening action sequence that you're led to believe that, that you know, Mike Myers is, you know, skydiving through uh, the atmosphere and landing in his Jaguar and doing all these amazing things. And it pulls back. And of course it's Tom Cruise and it's uh, Danny DeVito. And it's all like these, you know, very famous actors playing these, uh, you know, very um, famous roles, I guess they are at, at this point. Um, and then it pulls back again. There's a cut and Steven Spielberg is there and he's directing this piece of shit movie. And uh, Austin Powers, the character, gives him some sort of critique and he holds up a uh, Academy Award. And, you know, th there is something that uh, Steven Spielberg is a very interesting director in that he makes... Uh, very heartfelt films, and he makes these global blockbusters. 
and he seems to have a good sense of humor. Like somehow he's had a good sense of humor about his entire uh, role in the film industry as being this pioneer, but also being like, uh, I, you know, I made uh, Jurassic Park and Schindler's List in the same year. And that's a like how, like you have to have a good sense of yourself to be able to do like these sorts of things, but then also to be like, Oh yeah. Hey, guess what? I'm the, I'm the best, <laughs> one of the best there yeah. is. And even all appear in a fucking Austin powers movie. Like this, yeah. this movie is so weird. And this franchise was so weird that it just started to pull in everybody. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't know if people realize how weird and big it was at the time. Yeah. They were just huge it, films from it being is a fun observation. Like, fart yeah. check movies considering when you talk to mike myers he talked about how the studio was begging him uh to do wayne's world sequel and asking him do you think anybody even knows anything about these uh swinging spy genre like people had kind of forgotten james bond much less the second and, and third string um michael Caine type of you know in like flint type of characters so to think that after the first one, it became such a, you know, uh, that everybody was hopping on board there that much. Yeah. Oh, that's and a cool choice. The, and especially since the first one wasn't initially a huge hit. I think my right, point right. Was, it was only became big on VHS, and that's sort of where it, where it turned in the, from this kind of goofy, kind of small, fun movie to this worldwide phenomenon was after it got on, on, on oh is that right the kids used to call tape yeah <laughs> so uh tagging out spielberg and austin powers is rich's choice which is what all right my first choice is quentin tarantino in desperado um, Ooh. i wanted to choose quentin tarantino because he's someone who makes appearances in his own film f films from time to time um and kind of thinks that he's an actor yeah he's not at least not one that i would say would be i don't know jeff you're you're the you're the uh you're the thespian of the group the how would you how would you rate his uh his acting chops uh i would say he's um like a dick miller kind of level you know like a a, a weird character actor kind of level actor. yeah i think that's yeah. right so i so I, and I chose Desperado of, you know, I could have chosen several Robert Rodriguez movies that Quentin Tarantino has been associated with and acted in. Um, the most, I guess, notable one was From Dusk Till Dawn, which he actually wrote, had considered directing before he gave it to Rodriguez. And he wound up taking a much larger uh, supporting role as one of, it's one of the two brothers along with uh, George Clooney. And how much balls does it take to have to be able to essentially cast yourself as being the brother of George Clooney. <laughs> right. Like we yeah. basically, we basically look the same. Yeah. <laughs> you could totally believe that we came from the same parents. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I chose Desperado because I think it's a little more in, indicative of, I think what his, his level of acting is, which I think I agree with you. I think you made a, a spot on comparison with Dick Miller. Um, you know, it's just kind of this, this sort of, ability to come in and play a very specific character who is usually kind of coked up yeah rambling foaming kind of rambling a lot very yeah. fast talking basically he's playing himself yeah and that's what he's doing in desperado he's basically playing a coked up grease ball a real stretch for him from what i understand um <laughs> and a bonus to this is he winds up getting plugged square in the head at the end of his uh his big scene mm-hmm which I imagine for some people would be a little bit of wish fulfillment mm. in Hollywood. I don't, I don't know who that would be, but <laughs> let's just, just say that. Um, yeah, because Quentin Tarantino is regularly the weakest link of his own movies when he acts in them. But I think for Desperado, for playing this one specific very much, I almost wonder if he was written based on Quentin Tarantino to some extent and Robert Rodriguez just said, hey, why don't you just come in and do this since this is basically you. Mm -hmm. um, and in an episode of Golden Girls where he played an Elvis impersonator. Oh, he did? <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. That's where he got his, uh, I think that's where he, his Elvis where he raised his money to be able to 
some of the money to be able to make uh, reservoir dogs. Wow. From a day player on the Golden Girls. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, uh, so the challengers in the ring were uh, the Magic Christian, Roman Polanski, Steven Spielberg in Austin Powers, and Quentin Tarantino in Desperado. And this round is going to go to Art Hadley, who suggested Roman Polanski in the Magic Christian. So this sorry, Michael guy. and Richard. <laughs> Art is a very knowledgeable dude, so um, he, he probably has two or three uh, uh, little... Um, uh, razors in his in his uh, underwear or whatever we need to kind of gag the rest of this match. So, all right. So round two begins. Round two begins. And speaking of actors who are known for cameos, and uh, speaking of directors who are associated with the independent film movement, uh, this is a double tag team match because our suggester <laughs> uh bill weingartner has uh two choices two choices this is bill weingartner i've got two directors for you who were not known for acting but were in another director's movie the first is roger corman who was in the godfather part two and the second is sam raimi who was in the Coen brothers film miller's crossing thanks bye um, Bill Weingartner has um, two Glengarry Glen Ross podcasts. Um, this guy <laughs> loves Glengarry <laughs> a lot. Um, so if you do have time, and I think you do since we're in an epidemic, uh, do us a solid and go check out uh, some of Bill's podcasts, the Glengarry Glen, Glengarry Glen Ross Infinity and the Glengarry Glen Ross Minute on Apple Podcasts. So, um, oh, one of, one of, the, uh, one of, one the, of minute the Minute podcasts. podcasts. Yeah, yeah, we great. should do a Mount Rushmore of just the, the Mount Rushmore of Alec Baldwin speeches in Glenn yeah. and Glenn Ross. <laughs> Bill Weingartner chose Roger Corman performing in The Godfather Part Two, and he chose Sam Raimi performing in Miller's Crossing. So we've got uh, two very burly wrestlers in the team, uh, Roger Corman <laughs> and Sam Raimi. Of course, Roger Corman as the head of a studio would show up in nearly every movie as a cop or a doctor or a random scientist in a lab coat or the sheriff who sends the kids off to sudden certain doom <laughs> with a monster or something like that. And Sam Raimi as buddy to the Coens um, cameo is a heck of a lot in the films of those guys who they kind of helped each other out. So, so that's Bill's choice. Uh, all right, Michael, what do you got? Well, I have another uh, cameo and this is, Peter Jackson in Hot Fuzz oh, no. as oh, wow. Father Christmas. I'm sorry, we're in, <laughs> we're in America as Santa Claus. Uh, at the beginning of the film, uh, Sergeant Nicholas Angel is shown uh, training to become a police officer, driving. Um, he rises in rank. He has this tough attitude. He's into fencing and judo and chess and all leading up to, you know, he's blowing things up and knocking down doors. And then, you know, it's very serious. Then all of a sudden he's stabbed by this wild Santa Claus in the hand, which kind of sends him, <laughs> sends him on his path to becoming, you know, the sergeant of this sleepy town um, in northern England. Um, and it's one of those cameos that you wouldn't know it was him unless, like, you had the DVD or knew somebody that worked on the film or, you know, things just start to leak out, especially in the – internet era i certainly didn't know this at first and then it's one of those things you discover later on because you know he's totally unrecognizable he's a he's peter jackson is a big dude and a big dude wearing a santa claus costume is no big deal but you know he's grubby and grimy and you know you see him for a split second literally stick a <laughs> stick a knife in, in his hand and um uh you know i i like finding you know that's that kind of that DVD nature of things. I like those Easter eggy hidden yeah. cameo things that you, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow is apparently not Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, Kate Blanchett. Uh, Kate Blanchett apparently plays um, like a surgeon or a, someone in this movie that's also wearing a mask and all you can, excuse me, all you can see are her eyes. And um, I love little cameos in this, especially amongst people who are friends. And they're just like, come on set for the day. We'll throw you into some costume and get you on to do something that doesn't pay anything, that doesn't mean anything, but I know you're there. And um, Peter Jackson is one of those directors that 
um, kind of along the Alfred Hitchcock sort of insert himself as a small, tiny part, usually non-speaking into all of his films um, that I think is very um, common. He doesn't do the Quentin Tarantino thing where he gives himself a, you know, five pages of dialogue thing. He's usually some grubby guy that's grunting or a picture on a wall or like a lab assistant that's tucked away in the back that you see him for half a second. And there you go. He's in his own movie, you know, the way that Hitchcock would do where he'd appear on a book or be the guy waiting for a bus or whatever. Um, but I like that, you know, he's dressed up as Santa and, um, you know, you talked about Quentin Tarantino ushering him, ushering people along to throughout their story. And if Nick Angel didn't get stabbed, would he, uh, be sent along? I don't quite remember. Mm -hmm. Well, that is a cool choice. I think that's very different than your first choice because I know in the Wayne's world franchise, this TV actor who had graduated into feature films did so much uh, direct address to the camera, broke the fourth wall, and then winked mm. a lot about the conventions of filmmaking, such as product placement, you know, or doodly, 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 you know, transitions, <laughs> things like that. Uh, so by the time we get to Austin Powers, the usage of a cameo and a celebrity cameo at that is obviously winked, winked, winked and laid on pretty thick. But it does seem like Peter Jackson is not... Wink, there's no wink, wink there, even though it's very comedic. It's not like they're sticking it out and saying, hey, everybody, don't you get it? It's Peter Jackson. So that's a, fu that's a fun difference from that first choice. Okay, uh, so I think Peter Jackson has both Roger Corman and Sam Raimi... <laughs> Against the turnbuckle, uh, pretty hard, kind of slat, you know, doing the atomic knee drop on on his head. So, um, Richard, uh, I like that this. Uh, this is the part where it, like the countdown. Yeah, we're doing like, <laughs> like ten, nine, nine, and then Richard just gearing up. Eight, yeah, seven, and the tag in <laughs> happens, and here comes Richard's choice. Let me do the. Make sure I'm holding the tag rope while I do this. <laughs> My uh, second choice is you mentioned Alfred Hitchcock. And this is a uh, choice from an Alfred Hitchcock satire uh, of his movies, uh, High Anxiety. Oh, cool. The Mel Brooks movie. Mm -hmm. And the director in, in, in question is Barry Levinson. Oh, wow. I did not realize, um, actually co-wrote both High Anxiety and Silent Movie. Oh, didn't know that. So that was something that I came with, a, a little tidbit. That's kind of where he got his start mm -hmm. in filmmaking was working with Mel Brooks on these two movies. Yeah. And as part of being the the screenwriter, Mel Brooks kind of get let him have a little little bit of fun with a minor parts in both movies. Wow. Um, I I'm choosing High Anxiety because I remember this being a movie that when I was like 8 or 9 years old, it would come on the local independent station. Mhm. Mm and my mom was a huge Hitchcock fan, so I'd always wa I had watched all the Hitchcock movies by that point. And it might have been the first time that I could remember seeing like a satire or something. Yeah. And I just thought the whole thing was the greatest concept ever. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're like nine, ten years old, and it's the first time you see something like that. It just made an impact on me. Yeah. Even though I know that there, you know, it's not the most highly regarded Mel Brooks film. Mm -hmm. certainly it's not thought of in the same uh, publicly in the same uh, weight as Young Frankenstein or mm -hmm. Blazing Saddles I think it's a really funny movie uh, yeah. so Barry Levinson plays a bellboy at a hotel that Mel Brooks' character is staying at and Mel Brooks is constantly bugging him that he needs a newspaper because he's trying to read some obituaries that plays into the plot. And he, the bellboy just gets more and more worked up about this because everyone keeps telling him, okay, the guy in 247, he really wants his newspaper. And he eventually just gets to the point where he comes into his room. Mel Brooks is taking a shower and you can see where this is kind of going. They, the whole setup is straight from Psycho. 
He takes the newspaper, he rolls it up in his hand, and starts just screaming at him, You want your newspaper? In this super high voice, There's your newspaper! And starts like stabbing and hitting him with it until he eventually takes off. Newspaper hits the bottom of the shower, and the ink from the newspaper starts <laughs> running into the drain. Um, I just like this as an idea of, you know, a lot of these are or the sort of like the Spielberg thing where it's, hey, it's almost the sense of, hey, this must be an important movie because we got an important director to come in and do something wacky for us. So this must be a big deal. Yeah. This is kind of the opposite of this. This is a director showing up in someone else's movie before they became a famous director because this was Mm -hmm. a couple of years before Diner Mm -hmm. came out, before Barry Levinson was anything more than a script writer. Yeah. So I just love that. I, I just love this idea of this soon-to-be famous director appearing in this one very funny scene in this movie. Yeah, I think it's fun to see professionals having a good time at their job. And when Spielberg cameos in Austin Powers, it reminds me or makes me believe that they still all have this camaraderie in what they do as professionals and that they they just want to be in the business to show and make movies and have a great time so that's actually really cool choice i guys congratulations you defeated sam raimi and roger corman that was outstanding so uh uh richard <laughs> one point michael one point thanks guys this is a special summer slam you versus Richard and Michael edition of the Mount Rushmore podcast. Uh, we want to get you involved by going on to our Facebook page, our Instagram, our Twitter, and responding to some suggestions. In this edition, we've had more than one. We have got a handful, half dozen of recordings of people who've submitted their suggestions via voicemail, and it's super cool. And so you can really get into the podcast here at the Mount Rushmore um, a podcast uh, thing factory do us a solid and go back and download rate and review past episodes we'd really appreciate it all right getting into the second half here of our summer slam uh richard and michael versus you the listening audience uh we're going in to our next round and who's this in the ring it's scorsese and scorsese and Scorsese. Martin Scorsese as Vincent Van Gogh, directed by Akira Kurosawa in Dreams. I loved Martin Scorsese's cameo in Shark Tale. So unexpected, but the animation, they made the little fish look like him and everything with the eyebrows. Hilarious! Hi, this is Brian Scalaro. I'm a comedian and an actor. I like pizza, and I sometimes go to the bathroom, usually after the pizza. I really liked Martin Scorsese when he acted in the movie Dreams by Akira Kurosawa. Akira Kurosawa had a dream where he met Vincent Van Gogh. Vincent Van Gogh was so busy creating art that it made him feel less like an artist. But in the dream itself, it was Martin Scorsese that looked like Vincent Van Gogh because Akira Kurosawa felt inferior to Martin Scorsese. So he wanted Martin Scorsese to play Vincent Van Gogh. Scorsese, who didn't speak Japanese, thought it was a bad idea, but he did it, and he was amazing in it. Akira Kurosawa's dream, the Vincent Van Gogh scene, one of my favorite parts in movie history. So we've got Lloyd Umali, Brian Scalaro, and Christy Patterson choosing Scorsese. So we've got two Scorseses out there, one from Shark Tale and one from Dreams. Michael, what do you got? They're basically, which, which, by the way, are basically the same movie, aren't they? Same plot, same everything. Yeah, same, same style. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing scarier coming at you than like two tiny Italian twin, uh, Italian American twin guys from New York just like yeah. having at you, just getting at your ankles and your knees. And <laughs> there's a crowbar involved and a trash can lid. Um, you know, the thing about Shark Tale though is like that movie was just chock a block full of just the most obvious voice casting that didn't require any heavy lifting. It was all like, Oh, do you want a De Niro to do a De Niro impression? Okay, that's fine. Is a shark? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Same thing with uh, Scorsese. Same thing with like, 
you know, even Will Smith, it was just like, just, just do Will Smith, but like you're a, a mackerel, I think. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. But definitely Ziggy Marley's uh, greatest acting achievement to date. <laughs> okay, Michael, um, who do you got against Shark Tale? God, and- my, my third choice is another cameo. Because I don't know why I was just obsessed with cameos or just – I think I was obsessed with like small director appearances, although this guy's a big director of sorts. Uh, this is George Lucas in Beverly Hills Cop 3 playing Disappointed Man. And uh, – oh, That's a Neil George Diamond Lucas. song. Yeah. <laughs> this was in this like this weird nebulous time where like George Lucas was – you know, a decade removed from the last Star Wars movie and half a decade away from the next Star Wars movie and not really doing anything. Like Star Wars was mainly putting out, you know, uh, novels about the future adventures of Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and uh, Princess Leia. And like they were putting out like a bunch of video games. It was all like X-Wing video games and a bunch of other simulator games and like star Wars wasn't doing anything. George Lucas really wasn't doing anything other than like just developing tech with ILM. And then Beverly Hills cop, he's just like this guy that's standing in line to ride the spider at wonder world where, you know, Axel Foley, I guess the plot of Axel of this Beverly Hills cop three was uh, like diehard at like Disneyland. And then he comes in and he saves the day and yada, yada and butts in line and, you know, George Lucas just like really disappointed he can't ride some crappy <laughs> ride. I, I, and like I, it's just I, so guys I really wanted to get onto that ride. <laughs> I mean, it's I think the the most amazing thing is that like the director, his buddy John Landis, got him to do anything. George Lucas yeah. is famously like is uninvolved in things in front of the camera. He barely wants to be behind the camera. He kind of just wants to develop and pull the strings and push technology forward and push filmmaking forward from a technology technological standpoint it, it's very strange to think of him like agreeing to stand in front of the camera the only other thing i've ever seen him in front of the camera really is like where he dressed up in like this blue makeup in revenge of the sith as like this guy in the background hmm. and it's, it's just like very strange very yeah. i think i think the strangeness is, is what's interesting it's just like, oh, there's, is that? I guess that's George Lucas. He's just wearing like a t-shirt and waiting to ride. So it's odd. I, and just the credited as disappointed man is just perfect. Or disappoint, <laughs> disappointed man is just, it's just great. I It sounds like the opposite. It seems like he doesn't have the same relish that uh, Spielberg has uh, on the Austin Hours. <laughs> He's kind of there. I love that you said like, like, well, yeah, you know, you were saying st- although Star Wars was dormant, George Lucas was reinventing digital production tools in the entire process of filmmaking as we know it in that time. I remember reading something that he said it was either pre Phantom Menace or right around that same time. It was probably in like a Cinefix magazine or something where he was okay. talking about how like, Oh, the next generation of, I, I like that we can all do our George Lucas impressions. <laughs> now the next generation of um, filmmaking is going to be 3d. And you think of and you think of that as like, fuck off. 3D is this 1950s technology. Yeah. But he was obviously in on what was going to happen to movies and how 3D would kind of change at least the movie going experience for what the last decade, 15 years, where it's hard not to see a movie that's been augmented to a 3D yeah. uh, viewing environment, if not entirely shot in 3D initially. And it's mm-hmm. interesting to see like, oh yeah, he, he was, he saw this 15 years before that was even going to happen and knew that this is this thing. But then he was also like, knew that the spider was going to be an incredible ride at wonder world in Beverly Hills cop three. So the guy, <laughs> you know, he's a visionary is what I'm trying yeah. to say. All right, uh, Richard. Uh, I don't know how well George is doing against uh, these, uh, the dual Scorsese, but who do you got to tag in? I'm tagging in. This is a big one. Hmm. Not a cameo. This was this hmm. is a uh, crucial person for the uh, plot of this movie. Uh, this is Cecil B. DeMille in Sunset Boulevard. Oh wow, cool! 
which I love. It's, it's a. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Full stop. And I think it might be one of the first times that a director has played himself in a movie. It must have been. I can't think of it. I, it's hard for me That's to interesting. think of other times before this where you've, I mean, where you've seen an actor, and you mentioned Spielberg playing Spielberg. Um, but this is, you know, obviously a, not just a quickie cameo. This is integral, like I said, to the whole plot of the movie with Gloria Swanson's character trying to, you know, get herself in cast in this next Cecil B. DeMille bio, or this next gigantic Cecil B. DeMille production. And Cecil B. DeMille was really one of the first, maybe the first director who became a, like a star in his own, in his own right. You know, he wasn't just a, you know, he wasn't necessarily someone who was just a hired hand who was out there making movies for the studio system. He was somebody who, when you saw it was a Cecil B. DeMille production, you knew you were going to get something big and lavish and big budgeted and sprawling epics. And he's great in it. Um, like I said, I, I think that it's it's fascinating to me that this is really, a, like I said, I think it's the first time where, where a director really played themselves in a movie and played it, you know, had had to had to deal with the idea of someone else writing lines that they would say in, in, theoretically in real life. I just find that very, I would think as a director, it would be very hard to put yourself in the mindset to be directed playing yourself, mm. even more so than playing an, another character. So I find that very fascinating. That is a fun choice. I do think of Sunset Boulevard as one of the most potent and dramatic uh stories it feels like one of the first kind of modern stories in which the second era of cinema was looking back on the first era and uh evaluating it and judging it and you saw somebody who had uh turned into a little bit of an uh, antique and was trying to shake off the 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 decay of time that had uh, impacted their career so that's all right, Jeff. We got it. You've seen. You've been to film school. Look at that. I mean, he's just reading his notes from. Oh, no, no. He's, we got it. I'm starting Don't to talk like shit now. I got to stop that. Here. So, uh, so yeah, it almost seems like the first time that could even happen. I imagine Chaplin or or Keaton or somebody in the shorts comedy era, you know, might have popped in, you know, mm. to play the director yeah. or something like that. But that's a different yeah, idea. And it's interesting because Demille, a, a movie made in 1950. And he's sort of this figure that is kind of trying to straddle these two eras of filmmaking, right? Because he's someone whose career goes back to the 1920s. But yeah. by 1950, he's still, you know, in the 1950s, he's still making, you know, The Greatest Show on Earth and... Uh, Beverly Hills Cop 1. Beverly Hills and... Cop 1, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Ten Commandments is something that he was, work, you know, working on. In, in the late 50s or the early 50s so he's still very much of the era even though he's someone who is also part of that older era that you know that they're like as you said that they're sort of referencing in the movie yeah that's a cool choice uh so at the end of the third round looks like cecil b demille knocks out the dueling <laughs> scorsese <laughs> And, so, and George Lucas. And George Lucas was over here. And George Lucas, <laughs> too. Uh, so speaking of directors who had belonged to uh, old Hollywood, um, who uh, cameoed, uh, our buddy Brian Kelly from Minneapolis, a talented actor and um, raconteur, because that's what you say, uh, chose a guy who was really hard to beat and... I need to figure out. You, you guys, you may have to argue this. Um, let me, let me play the clip. This is Brian Kelly from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Now, this isn't a movie, but it's one of the strangest examples of a director taking on an acting role, and that is Otto Preminger stepping into the role of Mister Freeze on the '60s Batman TV show. 
This is weird on a number of fronts. Number one, that the director of The Man with the Golden Arm, Laura, and Anatomy of a Murder would be tapped to play the role in the first place. As it happens, it was Preminger who lobbied for the role. It's often forgotten how hip this show was at the time. Even Frank Sinatra had made a bid to play a character on the show at one point or another. Preminger's grandkids were apparently big fans of the show, and he had enough clout in Hollywood to call in a favor. It's also weird, or maybe sadly not that weird, that Preminger behaved horribly on the set. Alan Napier, who played Alfred the butler and had worked with Preminger before, referred to him as Awful Otto. Part of the storyline involved a beauty pageant, and according to Adam West, Preminger treated the bathing suit-clad women on the set cruelly and inappropriately, even for the Mad Men era of the 60s. He also acted as though he were the director of the episode, giving orders to actors, crew, and the actual director, George Wagner, best known for directing the 1941 film The Wolfman with Lon Chaney. Finally, the whole affair is weird in how awful the performance in the episode are. Preminger is so far afield of the camp happening around him. There's no joy as with Cesar Romero's Joker or Frank Gorshin's Riddler, and no menace as with Burgess Meredith's Penguin or Vincent Price's Egghead. Preminger relies almost exclusively on this odd affectation of stroking his glued-on eyebrows and frequently exclaiming, Wild! Wild! in his Austrian accent. So much so that you almost want to say, stop trying to make wild happen. It might be noted that George Sanders played Mr. Freeze in the first season, and that Eli Wallach took over the role in season three, when Preminger was very pointedly not invited back. But nestled there in season two is a truly weird episode of Batman, featuring a director who probably shouldn't have waded into the acting pool. All right, guys, what do you think? Is, does this uh, qualify even? Ooh. I think we Maybe said it's films. hard. It's, yeah. I think we said films. I think that, I think that the hardest thing about, like, um, I have no memory of Mr. Freeze as a character on the show. Yeah. Like, I've, I've seen, I know I've seen, you know, there haven't been a lot of Batman shows. There was, what, maybe a hundred of them? Less than a hundred? Even less than that. I should know this. I don't know. You should know this. Yeah. I'm I'm looking up on Wikipedia really quick. 120 episodes. So, okay. Uh I've probably seen them all and probably seen them all multiple times. I have no memory of, like, Mr. Freeze on the show. He was played by three different performers. Um, Maybe that's it. Maybe it's just like, you know, um, Frank Gorshin and John Astin were so – memorable and of course Cesar Romero and Burgess Meredith and you know all the Catwomen you know Julie Newmar and Eartha Kitt and everything but like uh Mr. Freeze just like I you know I can imagine King Tut and Bookworm in my head but like I have no memory of Mr. Freeze being on the show at all how strange sorry that was just like a it's just deviating a little bit but yeah So, okay, so uh, in the ring is Mr. Freeze (laughs) under protest. I don't know how legal this is. The ref's looking the other way. Am I Um, in the ring or am I in the rink? The rink. That's me doing Schwarzenegger. That's perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. Uh, Who are we going to send in to challenge him? Okay, I've got a real real director doing a real actor performance this time, not just like – guy who's standing in the shadows and you're like, oh yeah, that's uh, uh, it's George Lucas. This is um, uh, France, Francois Truffaut as um, Claude Lacombe in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh yeah, I love that performance. Yeah. Um, where I think what is interesting about this performance, he, he's, like he's most well known as being a French New Wave director and he acted a little bit in some of his films and did a lot of voice work in some of his films, but he wasn't, he's not like a big time actor. And um, what I loved about this movie and this performance in this movie is that like having a Frenchman be the person that's the most knowledgeable and being, um, that is kind of directing the efforts um, in a very American movie this set in Muncie, Indiana, and it's set in Wyoming. And, you know, Spielberg is so very American in his sensibilities 
um, at times, especially in his early career, that having just like this a French guy be the expert and the person that reaches out and is most uh, empathetic and the most knowledgeable, I he's just so – he's just – there is a, a care in this guy's eyes and an understanding and a person that is – I don't know. I, I thought it was a very good just – actorly performance from a guy that um i don't know that really that really sells the film you know um i think having you know this is an effect or this is something that in this movie affected this entire in the entire world it wasn't just an american thing although later on it was centered in america you know you're kind of introduced to this person observing um, all these people kind of, um, uh, I don't know what country is in, but they're kind of um, replaying the tones and the, the musical notes over and over and bowing down and uh, responding to it. Maybe they might be in Egypt. And I think that, that, that having it be a foreigner in an American movie, whether he's French or German or whatever, I, I thought it kind of added to the worldliness of how important like – this encounter with aliens is, I don't know. I thought it was a really unique choice. And apparently he was based on uh, a real French UFO expert named Jacques Fabrice Vallier. Um, he was a, a, you know, a UFO expert, but they called it UF. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all. That's, that's the only joke I really wrote for this. So if you want to drop 59 on a paperback, mm-hmm. Hmm. Spielberg, Truffaut, and Me, An Actor's Diary by Bob Balaban. It's basically his di- his on-set diary, or from the moment before he gets to the set. It, it's 850 bucks. Oh, my God. A, <laughs> for the paperback. I lent mine to somebody. I didn't realize he, he could get that much for it. Um, but he talks about, Bob Balaban talks about kind of faking his way um, in the fr- audition where he was supposed to, you know, speaking French. And in his audition, he says, I'm not very good at speaking French. I don't speak it very well. And he says it in French or something, something like that. And they, they said, that sounds good to us. And so now he's got this part of this French interpreter. And mm. he's in every scene with Truffaut. And mm. Truffaut is on a Spielberg set, as you described him, witnessing aliens. Eyes open going, oh, my God, this is the strangest thing I've ever seen. Because... French New Wave, like he'd never been on a set that was bigger than a tennis court, you know. Mm. So here he is in these huge warehouses and looking up at aliens that aren't there and stuff. He he described him as just continually fascinated with this thing that is the United States of America, with this production um, that Spielberg was doing, and that the wonder that you see on his face was all real. And part of it was observing this filmmaking process that was not filmmaking by any standard that he had ever seen. So, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, we, we see it through his eyes and we see the wonder is on his recorded on his face very effectively. Uh, well, we, we got a, we got to, so George Sanders, Eli Wallach and Otto Preminger each played Mr. Freeze um, with the cool Mr. Freeze Ray gun that he had. Um, but Freeze is doing his damage in the ring and Manfredi's going to send in who? I'm sending in. Slammin' Spike Jones. Oh, from, kick ass. From that's the uh, 1999 film Three Kings. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and this is fascinating to me because um, Spike Jones wasn't a, a little bit like Barry Levinson, but he was known primarily as a uh, music video director at this point. He had done DC Boy Sabotage, Buddy Holly, Trip by Weezer, all these, you know, the great litany of Spike Jones music videos in the mid mid to late 90s. And in fact, uh, his first movie, Being John Malkovich, would come out the same month as Three Kings came out. Um, so it really was a, a leap of faith for David O. Russell to uh, get his buddy, who had never really done any serious acting before, into this, his, his what, would, what, what would wind up being his big budget uh, Hollywood break. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's great in it. Oh, yeah. I, I, I love Three Kings. A very underrated movie. 
and you know Spike Spike Jones playing Conrad Vig, who's this sort of rednecky hillbilly man child who has some of the best lines in the movies where he's yeah. just talking about things blowing up I mean, when a cow blows up. He's like, gosh, that's just like in the movies, all this kind of stuff. And he's apparently he he stayed in character the whole time while he was on set. And he was kind of going back and forth between directing being John Malkovich and prepping for playing this role in Three Kings. So David O. Russell would get him on the phone and he'd be taking a break from directing and he'd get on the phone and David O. Russell would have him go through lines just to make sure he could keep the accent. And he's great in it. It's he he absolutely he absolutely doesn't lose anything or doesn't seem out of place with big you know big name actors like George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg yeah. next to him. Yeah. I would say actually by that time Ice Cube had probably done more than George Clooney in terms of film. Like Cube had been in yeah. Boys in the Hood and a few other uh, uh, things. And so here's Clooney hopping off the small screen into the big screen. But yeah, is, does you feel like he's also improvising? Doesn't he talk about ass plans at one point or something? <laughs> oh, like, yeah, that's because the whole plot is they, they find the, the map to lead to the gold bullion yeah. In, in between the butt cheeks of a uh, yeah. soldier, Iraqi soldier that they captured. They tried yeah. to, he thinks that maybe he ate it and then it came out that way and Mark Wahlberg said, no, <laughs> it wouldn't come out, you know, that wouldn't come out right. Yeah, there may have been some improvisation there. I think yeah. David O. Russell allows for some of that. Noted noted hothead David O. Russell. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah. Tom, I, Tomlin nemesis. Oh, yeah. And uh, also George Clooney nemesis. They got into yeah. it pretty, pretty good on the, the set of this, if I remember correctly. But I, I, I just, I, I think it's, Spike Jones is someone who is, has made cameos in his own music videos that he's done. Mm-hmm. Um, has, does, has done some in front of the camera work with his buddies on the Jackass films. But this is, you know, someone who's really good at it and really only did it one time. And then just didn't, decided not to do it, decided not to be a, an actor in his own movies. Yeah. Has done some small parts, like he was in Moneyball, and I think he had a part in Wolf of Wall Street. So he's done some some minor stuff, but he's never really returned to acting, and I'd, I'd kind of like to see that, because he, mm-hmm. he was really funny in this. Yeah, agreed. Uh, so, guys, it looks like I think his presence in the ring was um, questionable to begin with, due to that he was jumping out of a TV show and into the ring. So, congratulations, you whooped on Otto Preminger. Do you feel good about yourselves? <laughs> oh, yeah. Take that, oh, Take that yeah. Otto. Take what that you going to do, Otto, when you come down <laughs> to the ring to fight the Rushmore boys? All right. So I don't know if we need to recap or not. So um, I think you guys got beat in the first round. I think you uh, – I forget what was the second round. We went three and one, I believe. You went three and one. All right. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. I'll take that. Yeah. And thank you uh, very much. Thank you so much to the people who phoned in their suggestions. Uh, we're phoning it all the time, but you just phoned it in for this episode. Um, uh, those would, of course, be uh, Christy Patterson Veitch. We had Lloyd Umali. We had Brian Scalaro. We had um, uh, Brian Kelly. We had Bill Weingartner. We had Art Hadley. Uh, thanks so much, you guys. Really appreciate it. And uh, I want to give an honorable mention out to uh, our buddy Anderson Dadu, who um, brought up an interesting thing when he suggested Penny Marshall as a choice. And, you know, I grew up with Penny Marshall as an actor uh, Mm -hmm. first. So I think it also depends on what era you find uh, some of these people. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. This has been the Mount Rushmore of... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you can. Here let's see go. if we can nail it on the back end. Let's got it. Come on. Oh, I had it written down. Non actors, non actor directors acting in other directors' movies. <laughs> I, as always, am Jeff. I'm Richard. I'm Michael. 